Um, and I want to give a quick introduction to my panelists. We have Robin Camero. She's founder and CEO of Craft and Atlas. She's a communication strategy consultant, meeting facilitator, and writer, intent on helping leaders get more done with fewer headaches by outlining clear creative strategies and solutions that build momentum and buy-in at all organizational levels. And Brian Browdis is president and chief enabling officer of the Browdis Group. He has served over 25 years in the senior leaders chair. He's a university adjunct and a certified coach, speaker, and author of High Impact Leadership, 10 Action Strategies for Your Ascent. And they were actually um, two of my sources for the February cover story of building operating management on the same topic, which this session is based off of. So um, thank you guys for, for joining me for this panel. Um, for that article, we pull, we, that article was built on a poll that we did of facility managers um, in early 2017. So I just stole some of the graphics from the article and I wanted to share them with you. Some of the key um, points that I wanted to underline was that of those 525 uh, facility managers, 54% of them said that their stress levels had been increasing over their careers. And the top three reasons for that job-related stress, not enough time to get it all done, lack of budget, and um, the job just kind of changing too quickly on them. So, Having all that kind of data in my head and um, also kind of knowing that this is just, it's a stressful job. It's not, it's not a job that you're just gonna kind of wish away the stress. You're not going to be able to uh, kind of um, just positive thought your way out of it. Um, it kind of made me wonder uh, how can facility managers be thinking about that stress? How can they be better managing that stress? And there's also kind of this reputation in the industry for facility managers being a bit of adrenaline junkies. And we saw that uh, borne out in the, in the survey where we asked, you know, how do you feel about your stress? And some people were like, you know, the stress is killing me. This is, I can't do this. And other people were like, I love it. This, this stre the stress makes me sharp. The stress keeps me laser focused. So I, I started to understand that there was a more nuanced picture in this audience about stress. It's not all bad. It has good aspects to it, but you know, how do you manage that stress? How do you know from good stress, bad stress? How do you keep that under control? And how do you also keep an eye on your team um, and maybe you're doing great, but how do you keep an eye on your team to make sure that they're doing okay? So the first question that I want to ask my panel is, uh, you know, why is it important in this industry, kind of knowing that background of some people love it, some people hate it, and it's just a fact of the job, why, why is it important to talk about stress? Why not kind of tell folks to just, you know, buck up and, and push through? Yeah. You want to get started? I would say stress is insidious. It accumulates without you knowing it. It accumulates not only in the individual, but collectively in the group. So if you're part of a team that's high stressed, and you go to a team meeting and you have limited resources, all the things that Naomi mentioned, you can imagine what the outcome's going to be. And stress can lead to burnout, health issues, heart disease. And it starts with, at that meeting I mentioned earlier, everything's, everything's heated, so you feel ineffective. So at the worst end, the worst case scenario, that ineffectiveness can lead to depression. Research backs that up. So very important to pay attention to, te uh, to stress. It's your performance. Yeah, so I wanted to pick up on maybe something Brian said. So uh, if, if we were doing this panel a year ago, um, I, 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 don't, I wouldn't have felt like I had much to say. I, I um, had gone to, I was somebody that was like in total stress denial. And I, I remember one particular week where I had gone to the doctor for two different, like not serious, but things that were just bugging me, two different doctors. And in both cases, like they went through all the questions and then they got to this point there, you know, like on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your stress? And I'm like, oh. It's like two, like no stress. And, and I think like in my mind, I had um, never wanted to kind of admit that maybe stress or even just recognize stress was part of my life because it made me feel like either I wasn't competent or couldn't kind of handle like this 
work that I had taken on or my family life or whatever. I just felt like I, I didn't want to associate with it. And so later in that week, I was back at my desk, and I remember at one point realizing like I had curled up into a ball, this tight little ball, and was typing like this. And I thought for a second, like, wait a second, like, maybe I'm actually, maybe, maybe some stress is actually happening here. And so I wanted to try to kind of tune into like what was physically happening and, um, and start to just notice that more because I think Brian's right. Like I think that one of the things that happens are these physical symptoms and they do accumulate over time and we kind of hear about people that get kind of towards the um, midway or end of their career and, um, and, and burn out, you know, and can't really go any further because it's accumulated and they haven't, haven't dealt with it. So you're talking about sitting there typing in this little ball. What, what, so as leaders, as facility managers and, and leaders of teams, how, how should people, I, the image that I have, and I, I don't know if this is true, you know, the frog and getting boiled and not being aware of things getting worse and worse because you're in that environment. How can you, how can you be aware that your stress is getting out of hand, that, that is not something you have under control anymore? Well, that's a good question. Does, that, does everybody know about the boiling frog? Story? No. You guys all know that story? No. no? Boiling frog. So it's in all the books. So if you put a frog in boiling water, it jumps out immediately. If you put the frog in cold water and slowly boil the water, the frog doesn't jump out. And that's a true story. So we are like that. And um, as Naomi said, as a senior leader, as a coach, I, I see a lot. I see like the, 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 the lighthouse picture of this. If you're not paying attention to your stress, if you're not paying attention to yourself, if you're not aware, the conditioning of the world is negative. That's a fact. Look in the grocery line when you're standing in a grocery line. Are they, are they telling you nice, humble stories or are they selling negativity? Watch the news. The very last part of the news has a one minute feel good section, but the whole front of it is the truth. So you have to really pay attention to yourself. How are you feeling? When you wake up in the morning, check in. Not a lot of people do this, but I can tell you if you do it, you'll be ahead of the pack. You'll be out in front. Collected, composed. Nothing beats collected and composed at work. Nothing. Yeah, I mean, maybe just to add to that, so um, I think Brian's kind of talking maybe about how you look at stress individually, but how many people in the room manage a team or lead a team? Probably most, of, most everybody. And, you know, and I think, like, my, my perspective on this has kind of evolved over time, and I think I used to believe that, you know, everybody's stress was individual, and it was kind of their thing. Like, that was their responsibility to deal with it. And I didn't, as the leader, I just needed to be in the role of kind of assigning tasks and kind of staying on top of that. And I think... Um, there came a point where I, w I can't remember exactly what project we were working on, but you know, we were under a tight deadline, and then the, there was clients crunch kind of crunching down on us, and, and the, the wheels started to come off. You know, the people were either showing up late, or they were snapping at each other, or we just weren't, we just weren't progressing. And, you know, and I think now, looking back, that was really just accum that accumulated stress on the team, and, and my inability as a leader to kind of help them manage that. And so I feel like for those people in team lead positions, it is our responsibility to help, help our staff or our teams um, manage that stress. And, and one, because we care about them. You know, we always care about all the people in our teams, but also just, be, just for the pure aspect of productivity. So people you know, become less productive or less able to keep up um, the more stressed they are. So I think for those reasons, it's, it's important to kind of stay on top of it and kind of look for those symptoms. Um, and I remember when one of the other sources for the article um, was talking about uh, one way that uh, maybe um, the productivity side was talking about when, when people get used to that stress level, it's hard for them. One way to know is um, when you can't unplug, like you're on vacation and you cannot. And for this crowd, that's, that's really hard. You have a building that does not stop. You have <laughs> tenants that do not stop. I mean, the reality of the situation is a little bit different, but as much as possible, um, you need to be able to unplug to like fully recharge, and if you can't do that, then that starts affecting your productivity. That starts you, you you get into this like always in fire mode, always in putting out the fire mode, and you're not kind of able to prioritize very well. You're not able to kind of get that bigger picture on the situation. One point that I want to um, throw at you guys though is, so there are people in this audience, I'm sure, that are thinking, 
I, I have, the stress is good for me. The stress is good for me. Like this works for me. So is that, um, what do you think of that, about that? The, the people who embrace the, um, the rush of the stress, is, is that a good thing? Can it be a good thing? And how do you know when it's gone from good to bad? Sure, it, it can be a good thing. When you're doing a presentation for a client, when you're doing a presentation, I don't know, you do a presentation one-on-one -on -one in your boss's office, you know? I've, we've all done that. So that stress is good. You're gonna prepare, you're, you're focused. That stress, look at, pay attention to that. Look at that big picture, get that lighthouse view. That stress has you focused on productivity. You know, you're gonna get the promotion. You're gonna get the add a boy, add a girl, whatever. That's good stress. And, and what else makes that stress good is it goes away. But what to pay attention to, and I have some notes here, is again, awareness. Be, check in with yourself. How am I feeling this morning? A skillful life has to involve you and your awareness. How do I feel? Am I um, reacting or responding? Am I overreacting? So when you overreact, you have an overreaction to something that's too small, that's a small stimuli. So what's, what's that tell you? There must be more there. That more there is stress, stress that's accumulating, like I mentioned at the, at the uh, beginning. That overreacting, you know, the mother that says, what do you want, Robbie? You know, meanwhile, she's thinking about her husband's getting laid off, the cake's in the oven, all that kind of stuff. And little Robbie, oh, oh dude, oh, you know. That's that more that's there. There's something more going on there, and that's what you pay attention to. It's not that hard. It's just that um, uh, being aware of it. Not many people do that. Check in with yourself. Oh, I'm fine. I don't need anything. You would not not do preventative maintenance on a building for bad weather. So invest in yourself for the bad weather that's inevitable. Maybe if I could just jump in for a second. So uh, just a quick story. I, um, my oldest daughter's in first grade, and they're learning how to read. And one of the things they have to do every week is um, to keep, keep a log of their re how many minutes they read. And my oldest is, I don't know if anybody else has oldest like this, but she's like really intense. And like if you have to read for 20 minutes, she's going to read for 25 minutes. And she's super competitive. So at the, um, at the end of the week, they add up all the minutes. And so she, she won last week the number of minutes and so she gets in the van back in the van and she's like mom i won the number of reading minutes and look what they gave me i it, here's my prize she goes it's a stress ball <laughs> and, and she's sque she's like i'm supposed to squeeze it and so, but then she's like but what's stress and so then i started to try to explain it like well you're you know you have a lot of things going on you're busy and i'm like it's all of those things but for me like what stress is 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 not busyness it's this loss of control. So I think that when we have, um, we can all think of situations where we were really busy or we had a humongous task, but you, were, you had autonomy. You could kind of decide how you're gonna do it, when you were gonna do it. And that can be really energizing. And so to me, that's not stressful. And I think a lot of times when you get feedback in the, um, the survey about people kind of, um, the, I think you said an adrenaline junkie, but to me that's, that's the reflection of people, facility managers who feel like they have some autonomy. And even though it's a huge job, they feel like they can decide when and how it gets done and they feel some control over that situation. And I think those are really, so that's a really positive situation. And clearly like some amount of leadership has set up an organization that empowers people to do that. On the flip side, we've all also been in those situations where you have a, like a humongous task with a, you know, a unreasonable deadline and, and you're being told, micromanaged and told how to do every single step. And to me, that's very stressful because you, you've lost control. And so I feel like um, both as an individual and as a team lead, the more that you can empower people um, you know, appropriately and kind of give them that sense of control, it helps everybody manage their stress better. So that autonomy, um what, um, from, from the leader's perspective, um, since, I mean, a lot of facility managers, they're, they're, they're the leader of their team, but then they have a, lay, a layer of, of leadership above them. Um, how, how can they then f work that? Um, since, since they do still have to work within that structure, how do you get that level of autonomy? Like, I'm in charge here, I'm making, calling the shots for myself so that you feel in control, you don't, you don't feel like you're being pushed around 
but at the same time you're working within that structure. Mm -hmm. well, that, that's middle management. I call that the pillow. You're getting it from the bottom and you're getting it from the top. But the pillow always comes back. The pillow always bounces back into form, into shape. So you're the leader. Um, think of a lifeboat. You're that boat for your team. You're the, in the storm, the boat is in, above the water. Again, you have to know when you're taking on water and what you are projecting to your team. We all project things. If you project stress, lack of resources, the leader at any, any level, the team, whatever, sets the tone for that team. So that's what you're going to instill in others, whatever you project. So just be very aware, very aware of what you are projecting. You know, freedom, like Robin said, yeah, that, that's, uh, control is a big deal because that's why we feel stressed. We feel like we're losing control. We don't have control over our, our situation. A lot of times we don't, but one thing we do have control over is yourself. And you can, you can project pretty nicely to your team, even though there's a lot of noise going on in the background. You separate the facts from what's really going on. The facts from the myths. That's powerful, and your team will pick up on that. And they'll want to come to you. You know, Colin Powell um, has, a, has a, a little saying that he says, you know, when, uh, when your team stops bringing things to you, you lost your team. So you don't want to be stressed. Oh, don't take it to Rob. He's just, he's going to shoot the messenger. You don't want that. You want to be able to be collected, like I said before, composed and collected. That's huge for your team. They need to be able to come to you. You're that lifeboat. Right. So, and maybe just to pick up on that point, I, you know, it, it might sound like a, to, to your question, you know, how do you kind of get more control or, or gain more autonomy, especially when you're working in a structure that might not allow for that today? And, you know, there's probably a dozen different strategies to do that, but I think it comes down to a conversation. And, you know, it's initiating a conversation with, you know, your direct supervisor, your manager, leadership, or whatever about, you know, identifying what the issue is and then, you know, proposing some solutions. So of all those people that raise your hand that you have a team, like, who has anybody on their team that either routinely or has before, like, just comes into your office and just dumps problems on you? Just every day they're just like, oh, you know, here's another issue I identified, here's another one. And like, I think what I've found so frustrating is that when you have people that are just constantly bringing you problems, but without any, any idea of the context or what their ideas are to solve it, it's, um, it's frustrating and I think it doesn't further the conversation. So uh, to me, it starts with a conversation, identifying what the issue is, and then just some ideas about how that might work in, you know, in your particular environment. Um, you know, and I think if for the most part, I feel like managers are pretty receptive to that. You know, if, if somebody comes out and lays an argument out to them, like, hey, here's what I've identified, and if we did these, you know, five or six things that would make it better for everyone, I think people, most people are pretty reasonable. Um, you know, in, in those particular cases where you're just kind of hitting a brick wall, um, I, I think there's some self-management strategies, but also if, if you don't have any room to navigate and kind of gain that autonomy and control, like, it might not be the right environment, you know? And, and so I think those are tough choices, but um, anyway, I think it all starts with the conversation. So when you're saying it might not be the right environment, you're, th you're saying maybe that's a larger, it's speaking to a larger right. issue that maybe right. I should be looking for a new home? Right. Okay. Yeah, and I mean, and, 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 you know, that might not be realistic in everybody's situation, but if you kind of think about if you're in a, um, an incredibly stressful situation where you don't have autonomy and really no room to maneuver, um, and you don't have leadership or management that's receptive to kind of solving that problem, you know, I, to me, that's, um, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> so, but, but I mean, conversely, what I see more often is, you know, uh, people really being um, willing and open to help solve problems when, when it's part of a conversation and people are bringing solutions. Um, okay. So, so we, we've talked a little bit about how if the leader is stressed and your team is less likely to feel comfortable bringing you something because they're not going to feel that you can hack it, basically. Um, and what would be, um, and then that just starts kind of snowballing to this like toxic environment uh, for everybody. Uh, what are other, because we all are aware of, you know, we don't want to be stressed out because we don't want to keel over of a heart attack or have an aneurysm or, you know, all the, all the things we all know about the awful things about stress and 
um, the physical effects on our body, um, but what are some of the other kind of uh, career implications that being stressed out uh, has on your career as a leader? So people who are stressed are in a position to make bad choices, bad decisions. And in a sense, it, depending on your organization, I'm, I'm not familiar with uh, every, all of your organizations, obviously, but, but I know the senior leaders, the senior senior leaders talk. I've been on numerous interview panels. They call me in to be on these panels and the questions they ask and the view they have of the candidates beforehand, internal and external. I can tell you they talk. So if you're stressed and you feel like you don't have any support from above, you're in a position to make bad choices, bad decisions, and your performance will decline. And therefore, your, your team's performance will decline. So it's imperative. It's imperative to take care of yourself and to be aware. Yeah, yeah. I don't know that I have too much to add to that. I mean, I, that to me is the big risk, is just um, is making um, is making bad decisions, and it's because when we are, when we're stressed, you're kind of overwhelmed with the amount of information coming in, and so one of our strategies for dealing with that is kind of shutting down and kind of close off those channels, and we don't want to take in any more information because it's just, it's overwhelming. And so obviously, when you don't have all the information and you're make, making decisions in that environment, you're going to make make some wrong calls. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, we all look at things from our perspective. I think that's the default, you know. But if, but if you can look at it from someone else's perspective, it's very powerful. So your bosses, you know, you, everybody, whoever's a team leader knows that if you have certain people on your team, you can delegate, you give them that task and you can just forget about it. Well, that's what your bosses want, the senior leaders want from you. They want to give you this and they want to be able to just forget about it. They don't want to be uh, a potential headline, a potential threat, a potential burnout. So they're looking to you for that. You're the, you're the professional. You're hired to be a professional. And stress management is part of being a professional. So show your senior leaders that you are that professional. You can handle it. I can tell you I've seen it. I've seen it with my best clients. When you do that, you don't have to apply for the job. They call you. Will you apply for this job? I've seen you handle stress. I've seen you perform. You know, so-and-so told me about what it's like being on your team. I've seen it happen. That's what I meant when I said ahead of the pack. Very powerful. Um, I have one more question um, on the kind of leader stress. I'm sp splitting this conversation between leader stress and then leaders thinking about the stress of their teams. There are two mics up here. So if anybody has like a burning question that they want to ask right now on the like personal stress, leader stress, um, after I ask this question, I'm going to pause and open the floor to you guys, and then we'll pick it back up at the end with question and answer general. Um, so uh, that, that idea of, you know, you're the professional, you, you keep it under control, um, that's true, but I'm also wondering, like, we're all humans, right? So how do you, how can you walk that line between, you know, we're not superheroes, we're professionals, but at the same time, we, we also, acknowledging kind of that vulnerability that, um, that, that you're not perfect. Does the leader have to always be on point? Does the leader always have to have this facade of like, I, I've got it, I'm, I'm cool, everything's fine? Or is it possible to still be a strong leader and acknowledge like, okay guys, th this is like crazy, let's, let's work together. Like how do, you, how do you walk that line? Yeah, for me, so I would say the answer to that question is no, absolutely not. Like I think that leaders who are able to kind of show the range of emotions and reactions to a given situation are much more strong, are stronger. Um, the, the caveat though to that is that you can't put your stuff on somebody else. Like, I think it's totally fine to say, look, you know, it, we've, we've had a really busy week, I'm feeling a little stressed out, here's how I'm gonna handle it. But um, where you cross the line and where I think leaders can't do is like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm feeling stressed out and out. all you people need to fix this for me. And so I think you have to own your, own your stuff, own your own emotions about it, and I think that it's okay to, to share what those are because I do, I do think that makes us kind of more relatable and more um, human and um, just kind of strength, strengthens the team when we do that, um, but just not making it somebody else's problem. I agree with Robin. No, you don't always have to be that. 
stoic leader. But show your team that you can relate to them. You, you understand the stress, but help them. That's the leader perspective. You have that leader perspective. They're down there in the weeds. They see a bunch of um, uncertainty, but you know why some of that uncertainty is. You're at the meetings when the budget's cut and where the money went and, and all those sort of things. So they need your perspective. And that's that lifeboat, it goes back to that lifeboat issue. So yeah, you can, you can show them you understand. Yeah, I understand, we don't have that. What can we do to shift and do something different? Your team's gonna really, really appreciate that. Oh, thank goodness, I don't have to worry about that. You know, because they are worried. The budget's cut and they're worried. Well, you didn't cut the budget. You know, you, this, but this, is this refocus, this reshift from the leader, okay, here's how we're gonna manage that. That's powerful. Um, you understand the stress. I'm under the same stress. I'm under more stress. Obviously, everybody knows the leader is, right? Under more stress. But showing that you, you care and you relate without, as Roman said, coming unglued. And that responsibility factor, that's leadership. That's, uh, everybody's a leader in that, in that respect. We all have a responsibility to, uh, to take care of our own stuff. Right. So Brian just said something that I would, um, so I, I agree with almost everything that he said. So there was one point that um, he said, you know, everybody knows that the leader is more stressed. And I feel like that's kind of conventional thinking. Like we kind of, as leaders, we um, assume that we're more stressed than everybody else because we know that we're, we know the problems above us that we're dealing with. But I was just listening to um, the, former CEO of Home Depot was telling this story about one of the things he used to do was um, on a weekly basis he would go out to the stores and would have dinner with, um, the, with the hourly associates. And so they're sitting there at the table one night at dinner and he's kind of complaining about his back and then there's uh, a woman at the table that says, oh my gosh, it's funny you mentioned about the back because I'm also having back problems and I was in traction. She kind of tells this little personal story and he realized like she, um, you know, he had flown to the dinner on a private plane and had access to all the best medical care. And so here's this woman who, who had a similar back problem, but you know, had a disabled son that she needed to bathe, who was in a wheelchair, and like her situation was just more, which much more complex. And I think when we open our mind to the possibility as leaders that our teams are dealing with um, not only the stress in their job, but probably a ton of other things that we don't know about. And, um, and not assuming that we're just the most stressed or um, most important, I think on the team, I think is really just an important message to convey. Different, different stress or also maybe the leader has more autonomy and that's plugging into? Yeah, I, I, do, yeah, I do think the stresses are, are different, but I think, we, I think we just need to be really careful about conveying the message as leaders that our stress is either more or more important oh. than anyone else's. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so does anybody have a, a leader? Yes, go ahead. Well, um, this is an interesting concept I realized recently when you talked about how stress kind of conveys and moves through the matches. Um, I realized I had been micromanaged for many years, and with, with all respect to my leaders, um, that I had made the effort not to micromanage myself. I realized I was doing that by micromanaging myself. I, I all came to me, and I didn't micromanage my team because I, I drive home every night and say, I'm not going to do that. And I, I realized after a period of time I was doing that to myself. So I just wondered your thoughts on that and see if you guys have any ideas or concepts. It took me like 10 years to look <laughs> I don't know if everybody could hear. Um, could everybody hear him in the front? Okay. So, so what he's sharing is that, um, you know, he was kind of, had been under a micromanagement situation and was just really conscious of that. What, like, what steps did you go through to kind of realize that, you know, build that self-awareness? Well, um, there was a tragedy work. Um, I had to do head assistant counselor to figure out how to handle the tragedy. And they gave me the train theory. They said, let me see, every day you go to work, every day you see the train coming and it hits you every day. Get off the tracks. When you see it coming, step aside, let it pass. So I did, but um, at the same time, um, that, that counselor had said to me, are, are you sure there's no micromanagement from you that you're projecting? And I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure, because I drive home every day and I say, boy, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. Is it possible you do it within yourself? And I right away said, yes, I do it all the time. And that's what happened. And it was just like a floodgate that opened where I realized that.
Yeah, I think that building that building self awareness is just so so key, and it does take. You know, we're all on this kind of journey of trying to figure that out. So you said it took ten years, and I think that's probably we're all in, in a similar situation. And and I think ways to do that. I mean, certainly seeing um, seeing a coach or somebody to kind of reflect back on that. I also think having regular um, feedback sessions with your with your team, um, and and. You know, just asking them questions about you know how you know how am I doing and and going in saying look I, I really I want your honest opinion and being really sincere and not kind of um, retaliating later on if they share something but kind of taking that feedback in and noticing where you might have some blind spots I think can help you build that that self awareness. So I would say congratulations. I'm serious. It's admirable. Everybody here has had a bad boss, and to not continue to spread that. Work is pretty dysfunctional, most places. To, to make a commitment that's noble, to make a commitment to end that with you, it's admirable. But it takes a toll. You know, there, there were ways to do that, what you did, and save yourself too, you know, from all that. It does take years. Uh, I, I always tell, when people ask, tell the story that I, I had more bad leaders than good leaders. I had a great job, permanent, in government, and I didn't have to go to college. I went to get a graduate degree in organizational leadership because I wanted to know how to lead good. I wanted to do what you did uh, because I didn't want to spread. I had bad bosses and terrible command control, terrible. Um, so I know, I know what, what you went through. But I went to graduate school to learn how to lead. So I recommend, you know, books help. There's a lot of free stuff on the web, PDFs. I have uh, some PDF books that I collected. They're my own. They're free. They're on the web. Kindle books aren't that much. Read and, and find out what other people did. Other people went down that ski slope. You want to go down. And um, they did a great job. They did, and they write about it. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So I got a great degree, but I'm going to tell you honestly, candidly, that I learned more from myself from reading books than I did in my graduate work. Take one more question and then we'll continue. So, the, um, I like the pillow analogy, you know, middle manager, they're getting hit in both, both ends. Um, I have to turn it to so when you're in a toxic environment. You know, you can be the best middle manager in the world, but if you don't have your, uh, your uh, leadership supporting you, we're actually, when they're adding to the stress, that's, that's, that's where we have a difficulty. That's where I need to hear what are the answers. And you think you can, you know, change jobs. Well, you know, that just passes it on to somebody else. It happens to the bus, not the way that you want to live your life. So what are the solutions to being able to, you know, manage up? Yeah, you're in a tough situation, I can tell you. Um, I've done it. I've done what you did. It's all about you then. And it's all about you. you. You need to get off the railroad tracks. You need to save yourself. You need to become stronger internally than what's out, outside of you. You become stronger in here. It doesn't affect you. You're, you're Teflon. You're coated with Teflon because you've read the books. You know what's right. They may not know what's right, but you know, and you operate accordingly. I always tell people, be the leader that you want to see. I know that's hard. I know your, your CEO or whoever, whomever is not that, but, that the, but, but that's their problem. That's their baggage, and let them have that. You know, um, to be very candid, some people are just stuck with themselves. I've watched people come, I've watched people go, and my deputies and other managers go, well, why didn't you do something, why didn't you do that? Do you think that person's happy now that they left? Do you think they're making the, the grass is greener? The same thing is going on. Make sure that doesn't happen to you. Make sure you don't retire angry. Make sure you are adding every day. That's theirs. All that stuff is theirs. The managers that I had, at least six. Um, same way. They retired angry. They're, they're angry. They're, they're, they're rough on everybody, their children, their family. Just make sure that's not you. You can't do anything about them. But just make sure you are, you are the best you can be. You are coated with Teflon. You are ready. That's what I did. And that's what this gentleman did. Because what matters? It matters what you take home to your family. That, that boss you had. You take that home to your family? No way, man. Don't, don't, don't give them that. Let that end right with you. And let it, don't let it spread to your team. 
Yeah, and, and I think um, the, the s switching jobs, I think, is, is um, appropriate probably for some people at certain points in their career. Like, that might be the right answer. For other people, I, you know, because, and I get your point about kind of passing the buck, and I kind of feel like all we can do is, is approach people you know, as professionals, as, you know, as, as other people and say, hey, look. So to me, I think it goes back to starting with a conversation about this is the environment and, you know, these are the problems that I see. Um, a lot of times you kind of hit a wall with that because somebody's not really receptive to, be, to, to hearing that information. And at that point, I think you have to explore, you know, what are your other options in terms of going around that person? You know, is there a conversation with, you know, their senior leaders or the union or some, you know, some other avenue to make the point? Um, just in my experience, I've never seen, um, and I, I, I've, I have some experience working in toxic environments. Unfortunately, I've never seen a situation where um, a team can make somebody change. And all we can do is maybe hold up a mirror and kind of reflect back like how their behaviors are impacting other people, but we can't make them change. And, and in the best case scenario, you kind of show somebody what the impact of their um, behaviors are, and a spark goes off, and they say, "I don't want to be that person," um, and and so they, you know, start pursuing these steps that Brian's talking about to change their own behavior, um, and sometimes they don't. And I think it's those situations where you've, you know, you've tried everything you can think of in terms of approaching them as a professional and bringing them solutions and showing them the impact and all those kind of things. And if you're not getting anywhere with that, then I think it either has to be escalated um, in some way around them, or then it's looking at other options. Um, so I'm going to switch my questions a little bit um, more towards the, the leader, towards their team. Um, and we've kind of been speaking to this kind of throughout the conversation. Um, but so we, we've been talking about how to kind of recognize stress in ourselves and how to know when, when we, it's getting out of control for ourselves. But what is the situation of the leader looking out at their team? And, and Robin, you talked a little bit about how as some managers think, you know, it's not, it's not my problem to think about your stress. <laughs> like your stress is your stress and my stress is my stress. Um, but from the, the leader's perspective, what should they be looking for in their teams? How can they know that something is amiss? What are some telltale signs that, you know, I, in the survey we asked, um, you know, have there been any moments where stress kind of got away from you? And a, one example uh, was very illustrative. Um, somebody said that they took a, sm a phone and smashed it to bits. Um, and um, that, I think, is the kind of, the kind of moment that we are, predisposed to think of as the stress has gotten to be too much. You punch a wall or you smash a phone to bits or whatever, but probably that's not the everyday occurrence. Um, so what are uh, other perhaps more subtle signs that people should be keeping an eye on for, okay, something's going on. I need to do something about this. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, again, like I said earlier, awareness, um, overreacting. Oh, Bob, I only asked you where the pencils were, and you flew off the handle, overreacting. There's more there than what came out right at that moment, right? He came to work elevated. Did you ever go to a coffee shop at um, 7 o'clock in the morning, and the barista uh, frowns when you ask for no ice or extra sugar or whatever? It's 7 o'clock in the morning. What happened? You know, there's something else there. So be, be very aware. Watch for that. Cynicism, oh, that'll never work. Whoa, it, nothing works, nothing will ever change. That's really, that's a, that's a pointer for you. Uh, I wouldn't recommend sit down and counsel them, but you, you can tactfully and diplomatically project, project other things and shift their thinking. It's very powerful. You do it without them even knowing it. You're that, you're that very skillful leader. You need a skillful life. Imagine. Yeah, I'm telling you, team members will want to go, can I go join Rob's team? Because, you know, I heard they're doing, I've seen it happen. These people, are, they're just a little bit more um, skillful and they pay a little bit more attention to themselves. So that's what you need to do, pay attention. And, and safety, safety is a big deal. You know, safety is everybody's job. In a sense, isn't stress everybody's job, everybody's business, right? Because if somebody's a little uh, overreacting, a little elevated, maybe they won't follow protocol. I'm sure you guys, forklifts, you're in scaffolding, you're, you're doing the whole deal with, the, with facility management. So safety is a big deal. 
So if they're stressed and their performance is low, it could be in a um, it, it, it result in an accident. Yeah. I think there's like a, um, a related data set to this one, and that's on employee engagement. And I don't know if anybody's seen these numbers, but there's it, it, there was a, a Gallup poll about um, uh, employee engagement, and it was something incredible, like 80% of people are um, not engaged or, seri or, or significantly disengaged or something, like, which is basically like almost all of us. And to me, that's related, because I feel like when people feel um, that accumulated stress plus that lack of autonomy and control, they start to disengage. And so in terms of the symptoms, Brian m mentioned one earlier just about when people stop speaking up. So you're having a meeting and you ask, are there any questions about this? And it's crickets. Of course, sometimes that's <laughs> just because it's early in the morning and people don't feel like sharing. But anyway, consistently over time when people aren't participating, I think that's a big one to watch for. I think when people aren't volunteering for things, you know, I think when um, when they when they're, you're working in a dynamic environment, there's all different kinds of tasks and projects and work orders coming in, and people aren't really raising their hand to um, to take on um, you know take on that job or don't seem interested in taking on increasingly like. Um, more senior like leadership roles um, because that's not appealing to them. Maybe they see that they see that it's toxic or dysfunctional. Uh, I think those are our signs too. Just look for those things that when people are disengaging. Yeah, like the disappearing, either physically disappearing, suddenly you can't find them, they're yep. hiding, or um, they're just disappearing emotionally right. from, from the situation. Um, okay. And so, I mean, what, you've t what, what do we do about this? Um, we talked about checking in, being aware, um, being, creating this environment of openness. I just, I, I keep coming back to this feeling that it's incredibly, I mean, ideally, you can go to your boss and be like, boss, I'm really stressed out because X, Y, and Z, and I wanna see this, this, and this done. And I feel like that's an incredibly difficult thing to do, um, to, to have that and trusting environment, to have that awareness of the situation and awareness of potential solutions. So I just really want to kind of try to give people, I don't know, some, some actionable pointers as, you know, what, sh what should we be doing to create those, that environment of, of trust so that like what, what should what should leaders be doing with their teams to kind of create that situation right yeah I think it's unrealistic in most environments to kind of go in cold to your boss's office and kind of lay out these massive problems even if you have some solutions I just don't think that's real you know that's not realistic so I think it's sca scaling them down so it's starting with you know maybe the smallest possible thing that you can think of that would you could change that might make a difference that you think they might be open to and starting there and build you know and building on it it doesn't have to be the whole the whole thing at once is that to like test the waters for their openness well, or because to me it's well it's it's testing the waters but it's also starting to build that relationship because there's the, the reason that um people are not effective in uh navigating that better is because there's not that strong relationship there with their boss you know and um, it doesn't mean you have to be friends or even like each other but there's this strong enough mutual respect and kind of understanding of like you know where people are coming from what their intent is so if you feel if if somebody doesn't seem receptive at all to like ha you know hearing that kind of feedback and making that kind of changes then I making the, that magnitude of change that I think you just start small so that you can start to build that relationship and they end up kind of it's building some trust over time. Yeah, there's research that describes just what Robin's saying. That small wins each day accumulate to create momentum. The momentum that I've, I'm speaking about in my whole, my whole talk. And it's both ways. So the boss, the leader, the supervisor, whomever, has more responsibility, I think, in my opinion. The onus is more on the boss to, to create those small wins. Hey, nice job. Hey, I saw the way you handled that customer. That was great. Thank you for doing that. But, um, but the employee, too, maybe just a smile, maybe just a nod every day, something little. Maybe your boss isn't approachable. Maybe he's uh, whomever, you know, Attila the manager. But you still can do that. You still, I did it. I did it. And, and again, don't take home their misery. You know, create that for yourself. And it works. And the research speaks to that, too. Small wins each day create momentum that drives 
the month, the year. Small wins. So it doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to have this big conversation with your boss. A nod, a thank you, nice job. You know, a lot of, a lot, it takes a lot, I know it does. It takes a lot for a manager to say to somebody, nice work, nice job. It takes a lot of strength. But you can build that strength. I've seen people do it. I've seen hundreds of people do it. And you can be that kind of boss. You don't have to go in and pull your guts out like Robin said. You don't have to be their best friend. You can create that, that trustful work environment where they trust you. They're not going to friend you on Facebook. You're still the boss, but that's okay. What a great place to work. I can tell you, I have team members, I want to join Rob's team because I see what he does with people. Um, to pick up on this gentleman's point about the, the, the poor leadership up and, and how to deal with that leadership, and you, the point of you've never seen a team change an individual, is it possible for the, okay, I have you know, up or above me, it's, it's not working out, but can we then lead ourselves as a team? Like, it's not fair, that, that shouldn't be how it is, but can you then decide, like, okay, this is where we are, and we're gonna rally and lead ourselves as a team um, and move forward despite of the challenges that we have overhead? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think there, you know, there's some coping mechanisms and, and there can be kind of inter, um, like inter-team leadership dynamics. And, and, and so I think this can work really well on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, so just kind of making the day-to-day -day more manageable. Um, and it's kind of a either um, a sp a, kind of an open or sometimes, you know, just kind of a just an agreement among the team about you know how to operate so that you can be um, supportive of each other and kind of help navigate you know when you're getting those pressures down. So yeah, I think absolutely that's one scenario. Yeah. Yeah. And is it is it is it possible to go ahead like over that your boss like go to your boss's boss? Yeah. Be like, dude, this is not working out. I mean, yeah. no, obviously not, dude. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sir, yeah. this is not working out. Yeah, and and it's. At times, that's absolutely the appropriate thing to do after you have exhausted every possible way that you can think of to approach the individual. So I think where it becomes problematic and a lot of like senior leaders don't want to even hear, hear from you until you've said, you know, we've approached, you know, we approached so-and-so and we've done all of these different things and we're still not getting any results, then they're open to it. But I think you have to give everybody the chance individually first. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I'm going to be quiet now and let you guys ask your questions. Um, there are two mics, um, if you could avail yourselves of those, but any questions that you have on stress and stress in the team, stress in the leader? Hi. Uh, something that I've witnessed since the 90s is the middle management people telling you that you can't come into their office to put it in an email and then may, may or may not decide to read your email because you're just their employee. So how do you get any of that communication started when their show shut off to what their team is doing? Yeah. Well, I think, yeah, that's unfortunate. Um, I would just say that you have, so in that particular, the email situation, I think if that's what their requirement is, then it has to start with an email. And, you know, if you're, it, it might be multiple emails, you know, maybe it's five or six before you can get them to respond. But if that's the only avenue that you have, I think you have to take it. And if you're still not getting, you know, any kind of re reaction or response after a certain point, then it has to be escalated. To me, that was, to me, that was very bad because I started working long before emails. And, and when I was a manager and a boss and things, I would go around and say, good morning. How are things going? Do you have any problems that I can help you with that you need resources for, stuff like that? This boss was physically two cubicles away from me. Mm -hmm. And in two years, never stopped in and said, good morning because it wasn't in an email. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was just locked in his office right. waiting for the phone call from upstairs to tell him what he needed to do next. Right, right. Yeah, no, I, I would agree. I think nobody would like to work in that situation. That's a difficult situation that you have to be in. Uh, it happens. Again, save yourself. It's, you, you know the old saying, put your oxygen mask on first. 
that gentleman is, is stuck with himself, as, as I mentioned earlier. So um, what I would do, uh, you know, there's all kind of quotes out there that email is not communication. You just look them up. They're all over the web. And it isn't. It isn't. It's what, the, way you, the way you described, walk in, walk around. Tom Peters wrote In Search of Excellence, and it was, it's the book that started the whole leadership revelation. It was management by walking around. That's where that term came from, In Search of Excellence. Look it up. You could probably get that book for like $4 now. It's so old. But it's fundamental, and those are the fundamentals. Those are things that never change. People love that when you walk around and say good morning. So just make sure you're not like that. Make sure you're not taking that home to your family. If you can't do anything about your boss, you're, you're, you're in a tough position. You are. But that's where you manage yourself supremely. Supremely, you have to be aware of what you're taking on, what you're taking in. Caroline, do you have a question? Good morning. Um, I have a quick question for people who are in the position of aspiring leaders. Um, I, like myself, who have very little experience in facility management, I was wondering if, if you could help me, uh, for someone who's starting off in this career, how would you, I, I understand there are different stresses, but how would you address different stress for someone who's just starting, or how would you help them uh, be vocal to their leaders or to their managers? If this is something new, and instead of cursing and hitting the phone, um, just go and take care of that stress part. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes a lot of guts. It takes a lot of, lot of strength. But you just ask them. Are you feeling OK? Oh. What, 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 why, why, are you, why are you so angry? You know, is there something <laughs> I can help with? You ever watch Mr. Rogers? What do you do with the anger that you feel? That's not so bad. That, you know, and, or, you know, if you look at the real leaders, the, the Tom Peters book, The In Search of Excellence, that's what they do. It takes a lot of crust, a lot of presence, a lot of strength as a leader to do that. I get that. I know that. I, know. I, I, I was an inspiring leader once, too, so I know. It's hard. But you may not say it, but you can think it. You can practice. That's the other thing that, that I want to mention, that this doesn't happen, and it don't change overnight. It takes effort. It takes practice. 